Thanks for being with us again on our live streams. Boy, we've covered a lot of different bases on these live streams. The importance of vitamin C, particularly buffered C, skin conditions, acne, PMS. Certainly the last few months, I think we've, Josiah has really improved um, kind of the whole approach and appearance so that it's more appealing to watch as opposed to me just sitting in front of a computer screen. So, uh, but, but I would hope what, what has not changed and maybe has hopefully improved is the quality of what we're delivering to you. Last week we discussed water, the importance of water. Uh, weeks before that, what is making you fat? Is it just the food that you consume or, or, or are we affected by the chemicals? Today, I want to deal with the, what about all this hype? Is it hype or is it fat? I want to bring some facts to the wheat gluten issue, books being written, um, whatever it is, wheat stomach or wheat belly and, and all kinds of different books that are being written. Is this something new? Is it a fad? Um, how about our folks that just kind of walking around saying they've got a condition and, oh, I, I have a gluten intolerance. How, how do you know that? Is there ways for you to define it? So today, we're gonna, as we usually try to do, as we did with water, as we do with vitamin C, as we do with PMS and perimenopause and hormone replacement, What's the right approach is we always want to cut to the chase. We always want to define what it is that we're dealing with and then give you the truth of that. But before we do that, I just want to encourage you with a couple words from the scripture real quick. I talked this morning. Um, you may be a Bible you know, believer. You may be a church goer. You may not be. I don't know. I discussed on the radio broadcast this morning, walking with God. What's the importance of walking with God? So I'm just going to give you a couple references. These are just a couple. There are many more. Um, Genesis 5. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God. He walked faithfully. What does that mean? Does that mean just like I take steps and... Is there something about this? What are the characteristics of this? What does that mean? We're all just walking here. You know, I go to work. I walk to my car. What does that mean? Am I walking before God? Am I... Or is this something about your character, about your demeanor, about your conduct, about the manner of your life? We see over in, I believe it's 6... 5, Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw great wickedness of the human race and had, be, that had, and I keep reading this wrong. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth. That's what it is. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. God is laying out here that there's evil that pervades our thought process. Certainly um, sin um, has corrupted us. Only one person, the son of God can change that. It says the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth, the human race that I have created. And with them, the animals, the birds, the creatures that moved along the ground. For I regret that I have made them, but big word, but, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was walking, had walked with God Genesis 16, um, no, 17, excuse me, and it says here that, and when Abram, he was not Abraham yet, the father of many nations, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. That doesn't mean perfect, but that means walking with character, with an attitude, with a conduct that is consistent with what we learn that is God fearing that is this direction, not always this direction. Walking with God. I have a couple more comments for you at the end of the broadcast. I'm going to pull some thoughts from my utmost for his highest. I think Oswald Chambers um, really hits the nail on the head on this one. He gives a good description of walking with God, the characters that we see, and what happens in those silent times and in those quiet times. And I'm certainly I'm um, going to div divert to him. The guy was just an amazing man of God. What about wheat and gluten? What is going on? What's the problem with this? What is happening? Gluten. I I is there, I, I made up a little kind of a chart here as to what I see is happening. Um, 
let's just focus. First of all, what is gluten? What is that? Well, gluten is a component of wheat. It's actually part of the protein structure of wheat, but it is inherent to wheat. It's, it's part of wheat. Now, what I'd like to explain to you is that there's been changes that have been made to this over the course of years, which we'll get to in a second. But if I have a true gluten intolerance, true gluten, I many times have to have a genetic predisposition. That means that I almost have to have an autoimmune, an HLA something, a genetic characteristic that would make me more prone to this. Does that mean that other folks can't develop celiac disease and a, a, a disorder of the gut? No, anybody can, but many folks have a genetic leaning, first of all. And what is this characterized by? Well, it's typically characterized by diarrhea, tremendous flatulence, um, significant bowel movements after a meal, um, weight loss, anemia, deficiencies in minerals, inability to raise your vitamin D, shortened stature in younger children, a decline in weight, a loss of weight, a uh, uh, literally a loss of even your anabolism, lean muscle mass. Why? Because of the inability to absorb foodstuffs because there's an immune reaction that's taking place, triggering damage, celiac disease, to the cilia, the lining, the hair-like projections that line the intestinal tract, they become damaged and matted. And so instead of them being erect, they're basically lying down. And you can't absorb, you can't get nutrients through. Now, this is true Frank celiac disease. But here's what I want to talk to you about today. Are there other conditions that are not necessarily celiac disease where you have this damage to the intestinal tract that you have characteristic um, excessive bowel movements, flatulence, uh, malodorous stool, bloating, gas, distension, all types of digestive problems, which would be characteristics of celiac disease. I, I don't want to kind of go there today because that is kind of a whole nother layer. Folks that have celiac disease, they have to be gluten-free. They really do. I'll get back to, I'll come back to why I believe we're in the position that we're in today. The other side of this I want to talk about is that folks that don't necessarily have celiac disease, but that is it possible, is it just possible that some of this is not hype and some of it is reality, that I am triggering sometimes endocrine or thyroid problems, that I am opening up the door to cardiovascular risks and cardiovascular disease, that I am increasing the risk for cognitive dysfunction and decline, that I am somehow affecting skeletal muscle, connective tissue, the musculature, pain, inflammation, that I am affecting dermatologic conditions, skin. I mean, this list goes on. I, I, could, have, I could have six of these boards and have arrows going everywhere. Uh, what about uh, gluten-induced ataxias or let's just say neurologic Something affecting the neural, your nervous system and then the neurology that affects the entire system flowing from your central nervous system to your extremities. Is there an area that we move from just being, okay, you have, you've been documented, you've had a jejunal biopsy and you have a gluten intolerance, you have damage, you have celiac disease, that is a given. Those folks go into another category. There's no doubt that those individuals, if they don't deal with this, have higher rates of morbidity and mortality, more diseases, more immune derangements, more autoimmune conditions, higher rates of cancer. I mean, the list just goes on. And they typically die earlier, younger, unfortunately, God forbid, because they don't deal with it. But that area is pretty black and white. I mean, that, that to me is pretty black and white. The area I want to deal with today, the rest of this, is this hype. What's going on? Hey, you should eat, you know, as many out there profess, you know, you should eat a paleolithic diet. Now, please don't send me bad emails and rough me up on this because I don't, I don't want to demean or discourage. I, 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 just, I just think I get a little concerned. Well, you know, we, the proponents of the paleo or is that we will, well, we kind of came from cavemen. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. We did not, and we didn't evolve. 
I'm not an evolutionary uh, result of, and what am I going to evolve to in a million years? No, I am created by God. I didn't evolve from something. So I don't know that the Paleolithic, meaning only meats and vegetables is necessarily the way to go. But I'm not going to poo-poo that thinking 100% completely because there's something going on in the grain issues. Why is there? You say, wait, isn't there things going on with meats and cows and beef because of hormone injections? Absolutely. And we corn feed them? Absolutely. I want to get into this other area that we might be developing significant disorders from a gluten intolerance. So let's just lay this out. Three different areas. You could have celiac disease. You could have an intolerance, which leads to a lot of things, a lot of potential problems. You can have truly an allergy. By the way, University of Maryland has documented this, that this truly exists. You don't have to have celiac disease to have an intolerance to gluten and wheat. And then I could just truly have an allergy. And I believe there's probably a couple, you know, A's and B's under here that I don't want to get into because it's a little too confusing. But know that you can have three different areas. I can have a true frank allergy to wheat, to gluten. I, I can have an intolerance that opens up a cascade, a whole area. And I could have true black and white celiac disease. Now, why are we possibly seeing this today? I believe that it has a lot to do with a couple key characteristics and food scientists, food chemists, because what their job to do is, is to increase the lifespan of food. So we want to feed the world. We have so much ground. We have so many abilities to feed the world. If we would teach people how to farm, there's millions and millions and millions of acres worldwide. But no, you see food chemists that work for many of these major agribusinesses. Um, I'm going to sound like a, sound like, what's that word called? I'm going to sound like a, an environmentalist there, agribusiness, you know. Um, no, but what we've done is we have genetically altered, we have, we have genetically altered foods. So why do the grains become susceptible? They become usually susceptible because these are things that you're planting and putting into the ground. So what have we done? Well, we want to try to make wheat so that it lives longer, that it's not affected by the environment, by drought, et cetera, chemicals. Um, we want to make it, quote, what we perceive to be more nutritious, so trust me when I tell you that food chemists have actually done these things. In so doing, what we've done is we've changed the wheat from biblical day wheat, more the einkorn wheat, what Jesus talked about, literally, and I don't know all the details of this. Some of you might know this better than me, but much of the literature shows us that of the original einkorn wheat, we had 14 chromosomes. We've changed that to now 40-some. That was back in, I believe, in the 40s by this genetic alteration of the foods. Um, we have changed the distribution of the amount of gluten. There's a tremendous amount more gluten. Uh, wheat used to go, I, I know, amber waves of grain, I don't know, a four feet plus maybe in height. Now, or excuse me, yeah, yeah, real, real, real tall. Now it's much shorter. It's, it's, th there's, we've changed it structurally. Do you realize that most wheat that has been genetically altered is unaffected by uh, things like Roundup. So Roundup and pesticides, or excuse me, herbicides, will kill the weeds and kill all the junk around it, but will not affect the, the, the weed itself. Did you know that literally now wheat can live four times as long in the presence of a drought? So how did we come about this? How were we able to do it? So it's resistant to chemicals. It's resistant to drought. It's, it's, it's higher in protein. We've, we've altered and changed its structure. How do we do this? We genetically modified. We have genetically modified and altered the food. The, the problem is there were no studies ever done to see if I change the structure of this grain. Is it done just with wheat? No. It's done with soy. It's done with corn. It's done with... So I do not believe at the root... 
that we should avoid wheat just because it's wheat. I believe that there's a problem because it's been altered, and I'm going to go to that right now. I believe that's where the situation is. I don't believe what God created was bad. Uh, we, have, we have created the problem. And so now we, we have the problem. What is that problem? What, what are some of the issues? What we see is that there are higher rates of inflammatory types of conditions that I believe you can link. I'm not even going to go to, I'm not go to celiac disease, to a gluten intolerance. I believe we see more autoimmune conditions, thyroid, huge link here with thyroid conditions. Uh, folks, even with adrenal dysfunction and damage, many times positive links to gluten intolerance. Now, why would this be happening? But before I go any farther, why this is happening is because what it seems to be doing is the lining of your intestinal tract, as you consume this gluten-based food, what is happening is that it's damaging and inflaming the lining of the gut. So once you inflame the lining of the gut, we have taught you forever and a day, we have outside your, gu your gut what's called the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, the GALT system. So not only can I create a leaky gut situation here, but now what I can do is I can begin to antagonize the immune system, hence autoimmune conditions. So these, a lot of these thyroid problems with folks with Hashimoto's, and Graves' disease and so on, it's autoimmune. It's potentially not 100%. This is why I, today I want to bring some clarity to this. Every individual with Hashimoto's thyroiditis or damage to their adrenals, such as Addison's um, or Graves' disease, or <laughs> I can go on here, autoimmune hepatitis, biliary cirrhosis, you, 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 there are so many different immune conditions that you can name that come from an intolerance or damage to the gut wall, and it can damage the GALT-associated lymphoid tissue, which then can set off an immune response, an aggravated immune response to the rest of your system. Do you know that even the brain is in here? So I, I literally could go on the brain, your musculature, your nervous tissue, your joints can be affected. By what? So you're telling me that when I eat this food, it goes and damages my brain. I eat this food and it goes and damages my nerves, my joints, my muscles. My, I can trigger autoimmune thyroid issues. I can trigger, what did you say? What, what is autoimmune hepatitis? I thought you got hepatitis from dirty needles and so on. And that's hepatitis C. You can, you can contract an autoimmune hepatitis, which is an, a self-attacking antibodies that are destroying your liver. Did you realize that type 1 diabetes has a strong link here? to an autoimmune condition where it's self-attacking and it's damaging your pancreas, your islet cells. I mean, this list can go on. You're saying, Joe, you're, so you're buying into this. I'm not saying that I'm buying into it. I'm telling you that if you begin to look at the rate of autoimmune disorders and conditions and the amount of wheat that we consume, if it were einkorn wheat of Jesus' day, I don't think we have a problem. I think we have a problem because we're consuming man-made foods, man-altered foods. The wheat of today is not the wheat of decades ago, 100 years ago. The wheat today is radically different than the wheat of 1900, clearing away, let alone in Jesus' day mainly because of the changes that happened through the 40s and 60s and have come forward because of what we've done to it. So is it possible that this whole scenario can have a trigger and a link, all these disorders and all these diseases? I firmly believe that that is very, very possible. There's no doubt about it. Um, I have scads of literature that even show that folks that have been diagnosed with certain diseases of unknown etiology no known cause. They can't figure out exactly what it is and get them off gluten and wheat-based products and they dramatically improve. 
You realize there's even a link to simple things such as literally sinus allergies, asthma. <clears throat> I mean, th this, this list could go on. How about weight gain? I'm going to talk about that maybe after the break. Is it possible that weight gain, how many folks that are battling weight issues that can be triggered by this? I think it's a very real issue. Josiah and I were talking earlier before we went on the air, and we were just talking about the possibility. Are folks, or is this just become a fad that everybody that just says, oh, yeah, I got a problem. I got a, I got a gluten intolerance. I can't have wheat. Well, you can check. I mean, you can test for these things. You can attempt to identify what your issues are. You can have tests done that are called blood, this is blood work, that's called tissue transglutaminase. You can have an anti-endomesial antibody test done. You can have a uh, anti-gliadin and there's three specific blood works that you can have done. You can have done by a gastroenterologist a jejunal biopsy to see if you have celiac disease. But remember, this is not just about celiac disease. Celiac disease is a true, frank, autoimmune disease triggered by a direct reaction from the gluten that damages the lining of the stomach that then causes leaky gut, which also damages the immune system of, around the gut, which then sends bad signals. We talked about MS on the radio program today and good bacteria and how the good bacteria send signals. But this damage to the gut wall sends out inflammatory cytokines to distant sites, CNS, thyroid, adrenals, pancreas, Liver, biliary cirrhosis is damage to the lining of the biliary tree, which eventually just blows out and can just completely blow out your, your gallbladder. The list <coughs> goes on. Now, you say, well, so what was this? What were you talking about here? Well, this is to test for true celiac disease. But remember, that's just Roman numeral one. Can I still have an intolerance that I would show up negative here, but still have a problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. What if I just have an allergy? Well, you probably are going to have more things with skin conditions, um, <clears throat> maybe asthma, maybe the potential for more runny nose, congestion, and so on. That's more of a true frank allergy. Three specific, and again, I'm telling you, I think there's more to this than even that. I've just broken it out into three basic categories. It's a huge potential problem. So what about someone that's relatively healthy, has no problems, should they be on or be off wheat? What about someone that does not have celiac disease, has an autoimmune condition, should they go off wheat? We're going to talk about that after the break. What about um, if I have a lot of skeletal muscle issues, I've been to the physicians, I've been to a rheumatologist, and they say I have elevated what are called complement three C's. They say I've got, you know, I have a, I have a positive ANA titer, but it's not speckled, so they don't think I have an autoimmune condition. They said I have a borderline, you know, immune disorder, and they don't know if they want to treat it. They're going to wait. Maybe they'll put me on methotrexate. They're going to test me again in six months. And should, you, should you go off of gluten? Is there a possibility? There are some issues. What if you were battling significant weight gain and um, you have no known cause for it? Joe, I, I really do not overeat. I, I really, I, I'm counting calories. I'm trying to exercise. Is there a possibility that there's some influence to your thyroid and to signaling about how you eat and what you eat with leptin and ghrelin? We come back from the break. We're going to talk about these couple areas. We're going to wrap this up. And what should you do as a consumer just looking at these areas? Should I stop eating wheat? 
Should I reduce the amount of wheat that I consume? The takeaway message. What is the takeaway message? When we come back from this break, we'll wrap this up and hopefully it'll be applicable to you and your family's lives. Stay tuned. I'll be back in just a minute. Thank you for being with us and I hope you enjoyed that praise and worship. Let's move back on to our fad. Is it really a fad today that we're seeing? By the way, I want to clarify that, that you know, on my, from my perspective, I've talked about wheat and gluten intolerances and issues with wheat minimum 15 to 16 years, probably going more like 18 to 19. Didn't know as much about it at that point in time. Didn't have as much information. But just so you know, this is just what I've kept and I've acquired through the course of time on gluten intolerances and wheat and the differences with celiac disease and so on. So this is, some of that literature is 14, 15 years of age. So this is not new to me. This is not a new discussion. I want to bring some clarity because I believe what's happening is many of us think that it is a fad. There's many of us think that it's more fiction. There's many of you that kind of believe maybe that it's fact, but you don't know what to do with it. And you're saying, I don't know what the takeaway message is. I'm pretty healthy. I don't really have any issues. I take supplements. I take quality supplements. Maybe I've worked with you, Joe. I'm doing some things. So what should I do? That'll be our takeaway message. But I'm going to read you this. I pulled this article. This goes back to... um, March 10th, I talked about this on the radio, March 10th, 2011, this is over three years ago, scientists at the University of Maryland School of Medicine Center for Celiac Research has pr- have proven that gluten sensitivity, remember I told you those three brackets, is different from celiac disease at a molecular level and in the response it elicits to the immune system. The research was published. It also demonstrates that gluten sensitivity and celiac disease are part of a spectrum of gluten-related disorders. So what that's telling us is that they're different, they're distinct, but they're still overlaps, right? Gluten-related disorders. They're part of a spectrum. That's why I drew that little pictorial that said, all right, gluten, then frank celiac disease, and then all these other like conditions, like what is that? What are you talking about? Well, you either have celiac disease or you have an intolerance that can still open up doors, bad doors for you. I believe we still don't even know the full breadth of this. This was almost four years ago. We found differences in levels of intestinal permeability, leaky gut. See, that's fancy medical terminology. Intestinal permeability is leaky gut. And the expression of genes regulating the immune response in the gut mucosa. Alessia Fasano, had to be Italian, the researcher, no. Professor of Pediatrics Medicine, just teasing. Um, Medicine and Physiology at the University of uh, Maryland. There's a bunch of other stuff, isolating biomarkers, but next paragraph. In people with celiac disease, gluten sets off an autoimmune reaction. So you already know that. We've talked about that in the small intestine. The complex proteins found in wheat, rye, and barley trigger the immune system of a person with celiac disease to attack the person's small intestine. So it's not that the food's coming in and attacking it. It's triggering and antagonizing our immune systems, your immune systems, to literally then damage the cilia, which was like the matted down cilia, right? The complex proteins, blah, 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 they do this. Left undiagnosed. And untreated, celiac disease leads to the development of other autoimmune disorders as well as osteoporosis, infertility, yes, neurologic conditions, in rare cases, cancers. Not so rare. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is directly related. If you look at non-Hodgkin's lymphomas and the rate and the percentages, it is dramatically higher in a celiac disease patient, in a family of celiac disease. Now, this is where the key is. I want you to listen closely. I'm losing my voice. So that means I'm going to be done couple of minutes. Unlike celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, see the difference, is not associated with, quote, the serious condition. So not non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, maybe not severe malabsorption, shortened stature, I'm, I'm mortality and morbidity. So they separate them, which I thought was very keen for this medical school to actually take a stance. Usually, 
I hate to say this, but most in medicine don't take a strong stance about things they ought to take a strong stance. Common forms of gluten sensitivity include abdominal pain, irritable bowel. Now look how they separate it. Sensitivity, not celiac disease. Abdominal pain, irritable bowel, headaches, migraines, fatigue, foggy mind, tingling of the extremities, even evidence that looks at schizophrenia. Oh yeah, Eat, not with even celiac disease, and it's definitely related with an intolerance, and autistic children, how they could be affected by gluten sensitivity. There's more to this, and I don't, I, I don't want to go. I just want to explain to you the differences in sensitivity and intolerance. So now we're back to the, let me, let me, let me, I just circled a couple things at the break. I had a bunch of notes that I made before we went on the air, and, and I usually pretty much make notes a lot of times and don't look at the notes, but I, just a couple things I have to read. I guess I shouldn't make notes anymore. I should just fly with this. I call this silence. Now, there's silent celiac, so I don't want to be those two, but I call this the silent arena, the arena that people have not been diagnosed with celiacs. They might have an intolerance, and they got things going on in their lives. Infertility comes up, and, and I will tell you there's huge links here with infertility mainly because of the presentation of these situations outside the gut. These are the extra, uh, in, extra intestinal, in other words, outside of the intestinal tract. Wheat, barley, and rye are the keys. You've got to have an immune component to it. And I just talked about the schizophrenia, the migraines, et cetera, the risk for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, mortality in celiac disease patients, in some studies can show an increase of 72% and can, next to a population that doesn't have an increased rate of mortality. 35% that are just sensitive. So look at the ratio. It, it's about half, but it's still significant. Mortality goes up by 35% in someone that is sensitive but doesn't have celiac disease, doesn't have documented damage to their gut, doesn't have an immune reaction. Why? I believe why? Simple. It's because of the alterations. So you're saying that it's because the food's been changed. Yes. It's man-altered food. So I, I, literally, if I'm going to say this, I blame the food chemists. I blame chemistry. I blame what we've done to make it more resistant to drought, resistant to chemicals, spray the wheat fields with chemicals. The wheat lives, the weeds die. Now, you just think about that. How is it the same? It has been so structurally altered that it does not die when it is exposed to harsh chemicals, but all of the weeds die, no problem, but it doesn't. Fad, fiction, or fact. Let me just talk about weight gain real, real quickly as well. Um, I, I've often talked about leptin resistance. And I, I think this is a real problem today with weight gain. Um, insulin resistance, I will tell you, is the bedrock of weight gain. And I think there's a link here to folks, whether they, even if they don't have celiac disease, if they just have a gluten intolerance. If they have a gluten intolerance because of the changes and the structural changes and how it is so immunoreactive, I think that there are many folks that don't have celiac disease but are still developing a leaky gut scenario because of the wheat and the gluten, and it's creating huge problems. Leptin resistance can alter the signaling. This is documented, by the way. Alter the signaling of when I am to eat and when I am to stop eating. There's a direct link. There's a direct link to these components. So diseases is one issue. You saw it here, headaches, University of Maryland and said headaches, migraines, schizophrenia, autism, even in a non-celiac disease. So Joe, are you buying it, fad, fiction, or fact? What I'm going to tell you is, I'm going to clarify this because I want to be clear. I don't believe it's just the wheat. I believe it's the wheat of today. I, I really do. So for those that are, you know, we were cavemen, so you eat like a caveman. That's why the, the grains are damaging us. I don't buy it. It's because what we've done to the grains, how we've, we've manufactured the grains, that's what's damaging us. I believe to a significant degree, 
that it falls into the fat category. Quite frankly, I do. Um, I, I know there's going to be many that disagree. Many of you will disagree with me because um, you don't want to believe this because that means you're going to have to stop eating pasta and so on. Here, say, so Joe, what are you doing? I will tell you that over the last five years, as I just keep seeing it come up in literature pieces, 90% of which I just never even bring to the, to the airwaves because there's, there's just too much of it. Um, but I, I, I think I'm going to kind of reverse my role in the coming few months because it is a problem. I believe it's a problem with weight issues, <clears throat> with weight gain. I believe we're seeing a lot of women with infertility, miscarriages. If I could spell Josiah, it'd be good. I, I, I think, no, I, and I'm not asking Josiah either, so neither one of us. Uh, no, actually, I can Call spell. Mary. Call Mary. Mary will handle this. A, a lot of conditions that are occurring, I, I will tell you, I think depression, we already know that schizophrenia has a link. So celiac disease, and I go, so none of those things are me. You're, you're missing the big picture here, honestly. So I don't have schizophrenia, praise God. I haven't had problems with miscarriages. I, 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 I didn't have any fertility issues. Ah, maybe I'm having a little bit of a weight issue. Or many of you, I don't have a weight issue. Do I go off of wheat? Here's what would be the general theme. Joe, what have you done? I think a lot of times people just want to know what I'm doing. The past five years... I would, can tell you my dietary consumption has gone from here down to here. Very minimal. Almost when I have to. I can't tell you, like last time, I, I, it, it lunches. I'm either drinking a smoothie or I'm, eat, I'm eating protein bars with nuts and seeds. Apples, hard-boiled eggs. Josiah can attest to that. He's around here. He sees. Figs. Or, figs. Seriously, figs. I forgot my figs this morning. Uh, I got figs in here then. Um, you know, I'm getting salmon on a bed of mixed greens, olive oil, vinegar, chicken breast on a bed of greens. I, I, am, I have looked for ways to just, just get away. Can't tell you the number of times if we just, my wife just makes some organic hamburgers even. I'll still use some Ezekiel bread occasionally because at least it's a mixture. And there's still some issues with Ezekiel. There's no doubt about it. But at least it's a much, much, much better overall pitcher when you need bread. I don't remember the last time I just sat down and had something where I had a bun or just a sandwich just with white bread. Why? Because of my deep concerns here. So I will tell you, to, to a great degree, I'm, I'm, I'm buying it. And not just because of all the literature and the books now that I know that have been written. I am telling you, when I tell you that I've got literature that goes back eons, um, this one, <clears throat> I mean, no exaggeration. It just talks about the links. Now, this is true gluten intolerance and celiac disease. Um, I printed this, and I'm not even sure where, we, where Len and I at the time got this from. 1999. So how many years is that? Uh, 2000. Good math or ain't? What good are you, brother? <laughs> no, I love you, man. I'm just teasing Music, you. Music, man. Yeah, man. 1999, 2009's 10 years. We're literally 15 years out. I, honestly, I, I try to be authentic and real. I, I, this one massive literature piece I have in here that's about 25 pages. 1999, we started talking about this. So this is not just a, a, a recent, just that I didn't understand the breadth of until University of Maryland in 2011 saying celiac disease, allergy, and intolerance are actually three different things, but they, they're, they're separate, but they can, they're part of the same spectrum of disorders. You got a weight issue, You've got headaches and migraines. You just don't feel good. You've got aches and pains that you can't get a grip on. They've tested you for celiacs. They said you're negative. You've had immune derangement. You've gone to the doctor. They said you've got um, A and A titers that are positive, complement C's, but they tell you they don't know what you have, so they're not going to treat you yet. Um, you just can't get a grip on some things. <clears throat> this is going to be a bad statement for some because some people are going to totally disagree. But I think you start to really reduce your exposures. Going completely gluten-free is pretty tough. But you can eat f other foods. You just be careful because it's in so many other foods. I'm talking about major, major exposures to gluten. I know many people will disagree with that. I think needs to be dramatically reduced. You have to make more foods at home where you don't use a prepackaged food. Because those prepackaged foods, you know how many of them contain wheat gluten? Look at your treats if you have pets. 
if you have cats or dogs and you give them treats, just, just start looking. Like the second or third ingredient is wheat gluten. It's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's, it's and really, it's everywhere. It's used in everything. Why? Because it's a protein. They use it as a food extender. They use it as protein in food. I mean, honestly, it could even be affecting your animals. I mean, no question about it. My thoughts are, look to reduce it. Why even, Renee and I, we use quinoa. I, 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 I you know, I just use quinoa. I, I, I'm Italian. I could eat pasta literally five days a week with sauce and, looking for other ways. Renee made some like chicken sausage and turkey sausage the other night with, with uh, tomato sauce and, and vegetables. And I mean, I, I didn't have any source of bread with it. I am consciously over time looking for ways to reduce the amount of wheat that I consume. Why? Because of the gluten. I'm telling you, I think some of this... <clears throat> Is, is, is a lot of this are really their antagonists and they think wheat is from the devil and that literally you should be eating like a caveman and all this stuff. I, I don't know. I think some of that has a little bit of a fictional characteristic to it. Is it a fad? I, I think it's becoming a little bit more of a fad because even Josiah and I, as we spoke, hey, folks like, well, yeah, I'm going wheat gluten-free. I, I, I read a book and I'm going gluten-free. They don't really understand the mechanics. And people that don't understand the mechanics, they're going to go gluten-free for about 10 days and they'll be back to eating their pasta and their town talk. Um, seriously. See, I believe that when you understand more of the facts, that it can affect leptin signaling, that it can damage the lining of your gut, that when gliadin <clears throat> of gluten is not broken down, how it becomes toxic to your brain. I think when you understand that in those terms, you understand more of the fact, then you buy into what I'm talking about. I believe it has fact. I believe there's a component to this. And uh, I think your best thing is, is to look to reduce the amount of wheat and gluten. I really do. Look for alternative grain. No wheat, no rye, no barley. A lot of discussion about oatmeal. I don't want to get into, the, I didn't I always tell you, I don't want to get into those details. So wait a minute, but what about other foods that are genetically modified like corn and soy? It's a problem too. It's a problem on a different level. Maybe not like this. Why? Because this one has this gliadin faction that has an immune activating component to it, very antagonistic. I believe corn and soy and so on have other disturbances that they present. This one is significant because we consume so much of it. I believe my advice to you is look for ways to avoid it. Look for ways to use alternative grains, quinoa, whatever. You know, this big thing came out just a few months ago. Rice is evil because rice is loaded with arsenic now. Well, um, that's probably to a degree true because of the spring and why you got to look for organic whenever you can, unprocessed. Nothing's perfect. But we know this. If I consume too much of this particular grain, it can, it has the potential to open up significant doors that are bad for you. Walking with God. What does that really mean? Let me read to you real quick. Out of Oswald Chambers, I think this is powerful. Walking with God. And when I've read that in the past, and I've kind of, I felt like I've been led lately to talk more about that, and I think I'm going to continue to even on the program, because I don't know that we ever really get a grasp of what that means. Is that just physically? No, I believe it means our life, our heart, our attitude, the, our conduct is kind of manner, the mannerism is this way. And it's more of, God, am I in your will? God, am I walking before you? God, am I submitted to you? God, am I hearing from you? Man, the flesh, my physical flesh, I'm Italian, I'm, I get hot, I get angry. I want to react to things. I want to tell people off. The guy cuts me off. Man, I just want to like, I wish I, had, I wish I had a tank sometimes. I just want to like ram people, you know? And I got to realize that is not this. So in those times, when nobody's looking, I'm not walking. That's a, hard, that's a hard fact to come for us all to come to grips with. Here's what Oswald Chambers says. In learning to walk with God, <clears throat> there's always the difficulty of getting into his stride. See, we're in our own stride. He says, it's difficult to get into God's stride. Because when that guy cuts me off or pulls in front of me or is going 20 mile an hour in a, in a 50 mile an hour zone, I just want to run him over. Seriously. I just want to like, just like get out of the way. I, I, I got to learn to back up and say, God, you got to give me grace. You got to give me, you've got to give me more of your heart in this. 
There's always difficulty in getting into his stride. I love this. But once we have done so, the only characteristic that exhibits itself is the very life of God itself. The very life of why? Because I'm more and more out of the flesh. I'm more walking or submitting in the spirit. I'm ruled by the spirit less and less by my flesh. It was said of Jesus, <clears throat> Isaiah 42, 4, because he never worked from his own individual standpoint, but always worked from the standpoint of his father. And we must learn to do the same. Spiritual truth is learned through the atmosphere that surrounds us, not through intellectual reasoning. See, I don't believe you can reason this. I believe that when we hear of the story of Noah, and God said, I'm destroying everything. No, I want you to build an ark. What? I want you to build an ark. You have found favor in my sight. You are walking with me. You are humble before me. A mannerism, a characteristic, the character of life, how we conduct our lives, that is God-submitted, God-fearing. Noah, I'm going to spare you and your family and your lineage because of your walk with me. That we could be like Abram. That we could be like Enoch, as I read on the air this morning, which I didn't read here. That we could be like these men of God that walked before and with God. God bless you. Thanks for being with me. I don't know what's going on next. We'll find a topic. Reduce the wheat. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a good thing to do. God bless you. Thanks for being with us.